Let me know when I can record it. Okay. Everybody? I'd like to call this study session to order, the City Council study session on October 25th. Two items on the agenda. Um, I'm going to go straight. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't speaking to the microphone. Calling this meeting to order, study session of the Gilroy City Council on October 25th. We have two items on the agenda. I'm going to start with agenda item one, which is pension, review of city's pension costs and alternative repayment and cost management strategies. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, this is a conversation that as tonight is actually continuing from one that the Council had in February of 2020. Uh, that got a little diverted when we hit the global pandemic. But in that February meeting, council had uh, given specific direction to staff concerning how to start uh, addressing our unfunded liabilities. And at that meeting, uh, council, at one meeting in February, council approved the establishment of a section 115 trust and approved $2 million initial deposit. Uh, at a sub subsequent meeting, council directed staff with ongoing methods in which to continue funding that trust. And those methods were any excess fund balance at the end of the year, uh, anytime the city was meeting or exceeding its reserve policy, and then through prepayment of CalPERS payments, which saves us money in, in, in interest. Uh, two of those three options were not available to us in the last year because the city had a negative $8 million operating margin in 2020, and our reserves dropped to 24%. But now that we are coming out of the, the economic depression uh, caused by the global pandemic, it's a good time to start these conversations again about how we can continue to work at this uh, issue and, and chip away at it and, uh, and identify strategies that uh, will save us dollars in the long run. Uh, this is part of the council's strategic plan and work plan that they've adopted. And so this is actually for some of you on council, not the first time we've talked about um, how to uh, address these unfunded liabilities. And some of the methods in which we described in previous years at the time weren't very desirable, uh, but a lot has changed. And a lot has changed in the environment of uh, pensions and pension funding. And so tonight we're gonna and, uh, bring uh, a couple of people that you probably recognize from the past. Craig Hill uh, from NHA has been the city's independent financial advisor for almost 25 years, I believe. And anytime the city has refunded its bonds or sold bonds or did any major capital financing, NHA has been uh, with us for that uh, for now a quarter of a century. <laughs> And, uh, and also uh, we have Mike Meyer as well with NHA. And they are in the middle of this environment that we're gonna talk about tonight. They work with several cities from the beginning to the end and they're in different phases with different cities, uh, dollar amounts with more zeros on ours, uh, but also are, are what we would consider our industry experts in uh, advising us on how we could consider addressing this issue. So uh, please use them for their knowledge and ask them the questions that you need answered tonight. We're not asking for you for a decision on what to go forward. We're trying to just give you some information, get us all caught back up to speed on what's changed in the, the world of pensions in the last few years and uh, continue that conversation that will continue for uh, many years to come. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike and Craig and uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Is it okay if I take this off? <coughs> Good evening, Mayor and Honorable Council Members. Mike Meyer with NHA Advisors. Um, Vice President, I uh, have not had the privilege of being to the city, so it's nice to be here for the first time. Craig's obviously worked here for over 20 years, and uh, I do manage our pension group, so Gilroy is one of the 75 or so CalPERS members across the state that we work with. Um, everything from Pension 101 education to cost management strategies to uh, pension bonds, UAL restructuring. So it's nice to be with you tonight. Um, in terms of what we're gonna go through, um, as the city manager mentioned, this is a continuation. So some of the basic concepts we're gonna breeze through and we're really gonna focus in on the cost management strategies and specifically the UAL restructuring concept. Um, that is a fairly complex subject. Uh, we'll talk about some of the benefits. We'll also talk about some of the risks and if that is a concept the council wishes to explore further, we can talk about what that process could look like. As you may know, the city does have about a $99 million unfunded accrued liability with CalPERS. Uh, that's known as the UAL. That is based on the most recent uh, CalPERS reports that were released a couple of months ago. 
There's a couple things that aren't in those reports, uh, and we'll get into that in the presentation, but CalPERS did have a very good year last year. They earned 21.3%. That's gonna bring down the UALs of all CalPERS members, probably to the tune of 30 to 35%. They, they're gonna soak up some of that benefit, though, by reducing uh, their target investment rate, which is their discount rate, and we will know more <laughs> next month about what that rate's gonna be. Uh, the big takeaway, though, is that a year from now, your UAL will be lower, probably somewhere between 75 and 89 million. We'll go through some of the historical cost trends. We'll talk a bit about some of the options out there for managing these costs, as well as uh, perhaps a pension funding policy, which is uh, what a lot of other agencies are adopting in terms of just putting into place uh, a plan to address these rising costs. I know the city does have a section 115 already, and it already does prepay the UAL, so it is utilizing some of the uh, more common strategies. This is probably uh, not new to you all, but the city does cover uh, the retirement uh, plans for about 850 uh, members. 566 of those are miscellaneous, non-safety, and then 287 are safety plan members. Uh, about on the active side, 160 from the miscellaneous plan and about 100 from the safety plan. So about 30% of the covered members are active employees. And I think it's important to note that somewhere between 99 and 100% of the UAL is attributable to the classic members. So a lot of the newer employees under the PEPRA plans, there has not been enough time to really accrue any unfunded liability. This is just a graphical um, depiction of the $99 million uh, debt that you have with CalPERS. So essentially that is the difference between what CalPERS says you should have in order to be 100% funded, which is on the right bar there, about 308 million. You currently have about 209 million in assets. That's in the left navy blue bar. And so that gap, that shortfall is essentially what's known as the UAL. And CalPERS does charge you interest on that debt. That interest rate right now is 7% although they are talking about changing that number to somewhere between 650 and 680. Some of the reasons why unfunded liabilities have been growing for all CalPERS members uh, is shown on the right side there. They have missed their target uh, on their 20-year average. They've also ratcheted down their assumptions on their target investment rate several times over the last two decades, so they brought it down from eight and a quarter to seven and three quarters in 03, down to 750 in 13, and then 7% in 2020. And this is exactly what they're talking about doing again next month. They've been kicking around uh, either a 650 or a 680. So every time they make an assumption that they're gonna earn less, it, it drives up uh, the UAL for all CalPERS members. The other note I wanna make on this slide is that they they have also moved to a shorter 20 year amortization. So anytime they tack on a new layer of this debt, they are forcing members to pay it back over 20 years now instead of 30. So that means your annual payment on that amount is uh, a little bit higher. Slide eight is a, uh, we go back to 2014 and then we project forward the projected UAL payments. So this is what the city has been paying on that debt going back to 2014. You can see it's a little over two million at that point in time. 2019, uh, it's around five million. And then the current fiscal year, a little over eight million. And then you can see it projected to rise, uh, topping out at around 2032. And then it starts to fall away uh, and decline over the last 10 years or so. The reason I didn't point out on the, the previous page, but unlike a mortgage that has, there's, there's one loan and it's amortized over 30 years with a level payment, there's actually about 40 to 50 different layers of this debt. So they all have different terms. And when you aggregate it all together, that's why you come up with an irregular payment shape like the one you're seeing on slide eight. 
Now for the good news. Um, on slide nine, as I mentioned, the 21.3% returns will get incorporated into next year's report. Uh, we show you what the benefit is going to be on this slide nine. So we believe that if CalPERS ends up at a 680, that your new UAL will be around 75 million. And the payments associated with that debt will, are shown in the royal blue line. So you can see there that the payments, if they do end up at a 680, will hover right around that 8 million mark for the next 10 years or so instead of spiking. If they go down to a 650, we estimate that your UAL would be around 88.9 million, and we show the payments associated with that in the green line. So again, both are lower than what the current projections are, uh, but to what extent is going to be dependent on what the, U, uh, the discount rate ends up at. Some of the most common cost management strategies are shown on slide 11 here. The first strategy is something that the city has been doing in most years when it can, based on cash flow, and that's prepaying the UAL, uh, but by July 30th of each fiscal year, you do receive a 3.4% discount every time you do that. The second one is obviously any sort of negotiations with current employees. The third option is not commonly used, but it is an option. It's where you ask CalPERS for a new repayment schedule for that debt. So it does generate a more level payment, but CalPERS forces you to actually shorten the term, meaning that your, your, your annual payments are, are going to be higher in the early years. So because of that, most cities have not opted into that option. The other downside of that option is that once you create a new payment schedule under a fresh start, you can't go back to your old schedule. So there is some sort of, there is some lack of flexibility there. Where we see most agencies, um, uh, the strategy most agencies have utilized is under number four there. This is something that Gilroy has done in the past, and that's essentially paying extra. So taking reserves or taking surplus and doing one of two things, either number one, putting it into a 115 trust that's managed by, uh, I believe yours is managed by PARS. And then the second option is to actually send that money to CalPERS and you can specifically pay off portions of the unfunded liability. I think talking to CalPERS, there's been about two or 300 of those uh, additional discretionary payments last fiscal year. And on the 115 side, there's over 300 of those, I believe, as well. So very common um, amongst other CalPERS members. The fifth option is one that uh, became more of an option in the last two years uh, because of where interest rates have gone, and that's restructuring a portion of the UAL using bond debt at a lower interest rate. And that's going to be uh, the concept that we focus on over the next several slides. So the concept of restructuring the UAL entails borrowing money and using that money to pay off some or all of your UAL with CalPERS. The typical structure that is utilized is a pension obligation bond or a POB. That's an unsecured debt, so there's no collateral required, but there is one unique uh, part of the process that's unique to a POB relative to other uh, debt, and that is that there's a court validation process that takes about three to five months. Initiating a validation process does not lock you into doing a POB, but you do need to go through one if you want that option to issue a POB now or any time in the future. The second option is what's known as a lease revenue bond. This does require collateral, uh, whether that's buildings, streets, or parks, uh, or other sorts of assets that the city owns. I would say out of the 75 to 80 issuances over the last year uh, for UAL restructurings, 80% has been through the POB structure, 20% as a lease revenue bond. Some of the cities uh, that have issued bonds, uh, cities and other agencies, I should say, are listed on 13. We have seen about 70 to 80 agencies issue since the beginning of 2020 for a total of about $6.5 of UAL that's been refinanced. 
The interest rates on those bonds have ranged from about two and a half to four and a quarter, very dependent on uh, market conditions, the term of the debt, as well as the credit rating. And as you'll see on, in a couple of slides, there's been a trend downwards over the last 18 months or so. So most of the cities back in the spring of 20 were borrowing at around the 4% mark. We hit a low early this year. Uh, most of the cities on the top uh, row on this slide borrowed in the mid twos to high twos, and we're right around the 3% mark at this point. So there's about one or two uh, of these pension bonds coming to market each week, and from what we've seen, uh, they're all around the 3% mark over the last month. In addition to interest rates being lower, I would say the primary benefit is the ability to reshape your pension debt in a way that is more sustainable and that's tailored to your individual objectives. And the reason we wanted to put slide 14 up is to demonstrate that there's really no one size fits all approach to doing a UAL restructuring. So we've seen cities only pay off 25% of the unfunded liability. We've seen some go all the way to 100 everywhere in between. And then in terms of reshaping your debt, you can see here from these four cities that we worked with, they all took a little bit of a different approach. So Ukiah on the top left, they issued their bond during the height of COVID. They took a lot of savings in the first year. They wanted to bolster reserves. They didn't know where the pandemic was going. And then they had a linear escalating structure for 20 years before it started to decline, as you can see in the blue line on the top left. Riverside on the top right, they just smoothed out the peak in payments there. And then they had the payments in the out years in the purple line just mimic the current CalPER schedule. And you could see on the bottom there, El Monte and Corte Madera. El Monte went out 30 years in the orange line and then Corte Madera, 24 year, kept the same exact term as, as they had with CalPERS, uh, which was 24 years. Last slide on the, the market for pension bonds. And, and I think I've, I probably did not mention it earlier, but two reasons why this market essentially came back. One is interest rates, but also there's investors out there that will buy pension bonds for about eight years. There were no, there was no market for pension bonds. There were no investors that would buy unsecured debt from a city after the bankruptcies that occurred in 09, 09 and 10. This slide, a lot going on here, but really this just shows from last spring on the way left in the blue bars, you can see the rates that those uh, cities were borrowing at, uh, the high threes to 4%. They were, um, most of those cities that, you know, at that point in time, those were very attractive rates. And then you can see at the beginning of this year, that orange line drops very quickly. Uh, that's when El Cajon, Chula Vista, Downey all came to market, and those rates were in the mid twos. And then you've seen it hovering around that two and a half to 3% mark. And then we've seen a little bit of a recent uptick in the last few weeks as there's just been some more fears uh, of inflation out there. So we did look at a couple just very uh, baseline high level options for the city of Gilroy. Uh, again, there's with these UAL restructurings, there's really a, an infinite number of ways you can structure these different sizes, different terms, different repayment shapes, but to just keep it simple for this first meeting, we looked at paying off the uh, projected amount of UAL after the 21.3% returns are incorporated, so the 75 million. And then we looked at three options, different options in terms of the length of term. So we looked at a shorter 18 year option and then a longer 22 year option and then some uh, option two, which is a little bit in between. I should note too that these are based off recent interest rates from other pension bonds. And the one thing that's different from the pension bonds that have been issued over the last two years versus the pension bonds that were issued 10 years ago is that they all have a call feature, meaning that you can prepay these early, whether that's paying it off early with cash or refinancing the debt with another bond. In this, on 17 is a graphic that shows these three options. 
again, the bars are your projected payments to CalPERS. You can see those hovering around, around the $8 million level for the next 10 years. Through the restructuring, you can see all three of these lines bring the annual payment down to around that five to five and a half million dollar level. The concept I'd, I'd leave you with on this slide and, and very similar to a mortgage, the longer the term, the lower your annual payment level, but you do pay more in interest over time. So if you look at that green line there, that's a 22 year term. It's the longest term we, we looked at. So you have a lower annual payment level that does give you a little bit more cash flow savings in the near term, as well as more resiliency in the future to absorb future UAL or economic shocks. And then on the other side of the spectrum in the blue line, that's an 18 year term. And you can see with the shorter term, you have higher annual payments at around that five and a half million dollar mark. A lot of numbers on this slide, but I think the big, the big takeaway here is on the middle row, you can see the rate that we're assuming the all in interest rate right around that 3% mark, a uh, little over 3% for the longer term. And then at the bottom there, that's really uh, gets to the cash flow savings that are projected for the next 15 years or so. On an annual basis, that ranges from about 2.2 million to 2.8 million and in total between 30 and 39 and a half million. And I'll take uh, this opportunity to note that these savings are estimated. It does assume that CalPERS earns on average 650 into the future. And this kind of tees up our next part of the conversation, which is risk and CalPERS reinvestment risk. So this on, on 19, a uh, quick summary of the benefits. I think that those have uh, been, we've, we've covered most of those. I think the one thing I didn't mention was the increased funding ratios. The big risk of any UAL restructuring is what is known as reinvestment and market timing risk. And so typical, typically when you refinance a bond, you have locked in savings. With a, with a pension bond, those savings are unknown because they're dependent on future CalPERS returns. What that means is that if CalPERS earned below the 650 on average over the next 25 years or so, the savings we looked at on the previous page would actually be, be lower. And if they did better than 650, they'd actually be higher. And the, the general rule of thumb is that the city is better off if CalPERS earns above the rate on the bonds on average. So if you borrow at 3% and CalPERS earns above 3% on average for the next 20 years, then you would have been better off. If they only earn 2% over the next 20, 25 years, the city would have been worse off. And so because of this risk, uh, the one thing we have incorporated in all of these projects is what's called a stress testing process. And it's something that if the city were to investigate this idea further, essentially what a stress testing process means is that you come up with scenarios. So what if we have another 08? What if CalPERS only earns 4%? What if they only earn 2%? Whatever the scenario may be, and you can actually model out what your payments will look like with and without a pension bond whether there's savings, whether there's not savings. And so whether that's the advisor or an actuary or an underwriter doing it, that is a, a key piece of the process in our opinion. So to, to wrap up, I think it's clear that this is the largest debt on the city's books. I, I know that the city also has some lease debt that's payable by the general fund around 30 million. So this is about three times that amount, obviously something uh, to you know, developing a, a plan to address this long term is important. The concepts, the strategies that I touched on earlier, I, I don't think I mentioned it on that slide, but um, it's not one or the other for most agencies. It's a combination of things. So it's the 115, it's prepaying. For all of the restructurings that we have been a part of, um, there has been a pension funding policy put in place. There's also been a section 115 trust created to essentially lock away some of those savings because 
just to serve as a shock absorber in the future. If CalPERS does underperform, you have that shock absorber there uh, to be used for any future UAL. So whether the city moves forward with uh, looking at a restructuring or not, uh, pension funding policy would, would be something that we recommend considering at some point in the future. It's also a positive uh, for credit rating agencies right now. It's one of the things that the credit rating agencies are asking about as well, given that this is uh, the largest challenge for, for really every city in the state. Last slide is just on next steps, and I think probably at this time I'll turn it back to, to you, Jimmy. Um, I know when we talked, we wanted to uh, touch on the, the concept at a high level. If this is something that the city council wishes to explore further, um, this is, it's complex. There's lots of options uh, to look at. Uh, have, you know, obviously, we're happy to participate in future workshops. I do want to note again that the POB option does require a validation. So that is a four to five or six month process for some agencies who, who have started that process. A lot of the education and the evaluation and the stress testing takes place during that time. Or it could be that comes first and then a validation after. So. I mean, I could take over, but he directed to you, so no. it's okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Can you please go back? I, we'll take questions in just a second, and then uh, this will be public comment time, too. But can you go back to the slide that showed the options, the ones that we actually have in our packet, too? By options, I mean the, the action, the, yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the one I want everybody to be looking at right now. So as you said, the city is currently doing number one. We're already doing that. What we maybe didn't do last year, I don't know, is that the, what, what the city council, or at least the five of us who were on the city council back in February of 2020, decided that the interest savings, whatever that amount is, from the amount that we, from what we save when we pay it all at the beginning of the year instead of each month, is supposed to go into the 115 trust. So that's something that, if it hasn't happened, still, still needs to happen. The other thing we did fairly recently was start up that 115 trust. That was just in November of 2019. Am I correct that do, taking that action also helped our credit, credit score? That's something that, uh, that um, lenders were looking at cities, encouraging cities to do because doing nothing about this giant liability is obviously not in, in our best interest. It, uh, having a 115 trust is yes. definitely a credit positive. Yes, that's yes. what I was asking. Yeah. If, right. if you look at any credit report right now, right. Um, most cities have a, a you know weak rating when it comes to pension OPEB liability because it's so big. So anything that you're doing to address it, whether it's a plan, whether Thank it's you. setting aside money in reserves, it's all positive. That's what I that's what I wanted to confirm um, because we just did that in 2019. So prior to that, Gilroy was doing nothing. Okay, about this growing liability. So that's there, and the only ongoing funding mechanism that we were able to come up with, um, in addition to the $2 million that we put in right at the start, was the interest saved on that number one. And then we also said that 20, up to 25% of any um, unassigned monies at the end of the year from our general fund would also go into that. Because COVID hit right away, there was nothing to do, to do there. But... I wanted to explain to everybody that that's where we are. And then item number five is what you're here telling us tonight is another thing we can do, and that is to refinance. Basically, it's refinancing, right? The obligation. Would you not call it that? It's, that's correct, although it's, as you heard, it's a little more complex than that. So I, I understand. Our, our, you know, we wanted to introduce it. It's a complex undertaking. Right. It's, it is, it's a know. way to try to reduce the interest that we're paying, presuming that CalPERS earns at least what it, the interest that it's costing us to, to do the refinance. So those are things we can do because the, the, just in November of 2019, our unfunded, and this is just PERS alone, guys. This isn't the city's unfunded liability. This is just on PERS, was 82 million. So it rose to 99 just since November of 2019. So this, the fact that CalPERS performed well in 2020 and that it's now going down to 85 is not exactly down when you realize how quickly this thing goes up. Okay, before I turn over to another council member, active versus inactive employees. I have a question. 
the when you say we have eight hundred and fifty three covered members in in our pers plan five hundred sixty six of whom are in the miscellaneous category and two hundred eighty seven are in the safety category taking safety to 287 but only 100 are active so that means 187 more than double are inactive are retired retired or transferred so they're at another agency and these are these numbers are taken from the CalPERS reports not yeah. and it's not much different than if you look at other cities but they're tip you know the active versus retiree ratio is well under one for most yeah members. and it's and that ratio is declining for Gilroy so it's getting worse and worse and by worse I mean we have fewer active people paying in than we have people taking out it's another very important thing for the public to to realize that this the situation that we're in is is kind of critical <laughs> It, it's hard to read this report. I had a hard time reading this report without feeling just sick to my stomach. Okay, I'm going to turn it to council members and then we'll, um, I'll go to public comment. Council member Leroy Munoz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Myers, thank you for the report. My, my head is swimming trying to make sense of everything you presented. Um, so just a couple of questions to start, to start me off. With regard to um, you know, issuing some of the bonds, is it correct that again we're trying to beat what CalPERS is? They're they're estimating that they'll get in terms of their rate of return. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't put it like that in terms of trying to to beat I that. Understand, but that's um, the reason that some agencies have implemented this is one the ability to reshape into something more predictable at a lower level and where interest rates are. So the rule of thumb is that. You will be better off if if CalPERS does earn higher than your bond rate. Mm -hmm. So that risk reward calculation is something that's gone in favor of CalPERS members recently. Mm -hmm. It used to be that you know rates were at five percent. So the differential between what CalPERS would make and if you're borrowing at five is a lot tighter. So that risk might be higher at this point with rates lower. Um, uh, some members feel like, okay, you know, CalPERS should be able to beat 3% over the long haul, but it's not guaranteed, right? And you won't know that until 20 years from now, and then you'll look back and say, okay, we, we, we lost a little money if CalPERS only earned 2.5%. So it's, it's an unknown. And, and is CalPERS able to readjust their predicted rate of return every year? Is there a set it, increment? How often do they do so, it? And that's what they're doing right now. The problem is, is that when they bring that down, it's nice because your, your debt amortizes at a lower rate, sure. but they add on more debt because they, they need to, they do not expect to earn as much mm -hmm. on that money and they still need to pay out the same retiree right. benefits. That's locked in. And if they assume that less of that is gonna come from earnings, then they have to assign more debt. So when, when they lower the discount rate to 650, let's say, they're going to say, well, your UAL is going up by 20 million as well. Okay. Yeah. So it just, again, at a very, very high level, just my simple understanding is that it's, it seems hard for us as we kind of think about, you know, some of these alternatives. If we have a set number in mind, hey, we think, you know, CalPERS can realistically get X amount and no more, so we're going to lock ourselves into, you know, an, an amount, and then they continue to shift their calculus, and that. Does that put us at a disadvantage? Is it harder to plan because of that? Well, so that's that's the calculus that usually is part of these uh, evaluation projects. So the one thing you control is what you lock into on your new right. debt. So you, you take out CalPERS debt, you lock in the new debt. The problem is what happens in the future. And if CalPERS underperforms, you're going to get hit with more UAL no matter what. The, the, the thing we like to do is really illuminate those risks and say, Let's come up with some scenarios. Like, what if they only earn four and a half? Let's layer, mm -hmm. you know, if we're looking at this slide here and you set into place a new payment level at that green line, but all of a sudden CalPERS now starts to underperform each year, we need to start layering that on to your debt, right? Because you're gonna get hit with more UAL. Um, the, the risk side of that is that you have more assets exposed to CalPERS returns when you do a bond. So some of those losses and gains are magnified when you do a POB, and that's where the risk comes into play. Gotcha. So okay. a lot of the cities that issued last spring, 
and they timed it with the 21.3%, they timed it pretty well because they had more assets in the market, right? And so it's, it's never something we can predict. If I could predict well, yeah, the I mean, stock market, it's, uh, you know. I say timing it is more a luck than being smart You, you could good. control the borrowing rate, right. and that's why we've, we, we, I think it's safe to say there's been 80 agencies that have issued these instead of none two years prior because rates have come down to that, you know, 3% level and that risk reward calculation is a bit different when you go through the analysis. But that's still not to say there's, there are still outcomes where you could be worse off, you know. Okay. That's just part, part of the risk, unfortunately. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mary Blankley. Um, I, I, have, I have two questions. The first one is, when we hire an employee and they later leave, do we st do we contribute to their retirement after they leave? It's, it's good or are they on are they on the other <laughs> city's books now? I I just I'm super curious. We have a a lot of revolving employees right now. I don't know if the answer is. To some extent, we do. Um, every assumption by CalPERS takes into account how long the employee will be with you, how long they were with you, and then how much accrued liability they did while they were working for you. So it's it's not black and white, but every employee that's ever walked through this organization, and as I think I just heard vested, means five years at least in CalPERS, we're at some point paying for it, but you could never lineate that from person to dollar. It's just in the pool that you're paying into. Because like when we're when we're looking at like the re, the current retirees and that that's why I was sort of wondering on that part like do we will we just pay the person that they worked for us that they vested in? Yeah. So a typical employee who's worked at five or six different agencies in their yeah. career, each one of those agencies will be responsible for some portion of their retirement. Okay. And it will show up in their um, accrued uh, uh, un, unfunded accrued liability. Okay. Okay. Um, and then. Uh, What's the automatic trigger of us putting money into the Section 115? I I don't remember seeing that part. What, what is it? That had uh, three pieces to it, I believe. One was a uh, reserve level above 30%. It was 25% of the year-end um, operating margin extra. So if we had a million dollars that we saved in the year, we would take 25% of that. And then the third trigger was just the savings uh, percentage from paying the um the UAL in July versus monthly. Okay. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions from council, I'm I'm gonna ask one. How what uh where did you get the amount when it came to possibly just for argument's sake, exiting CalPERS, where did those numbers come from that it would cost us five forty five hundred and forty nine mm -hmm. to eight hundred million? To exit. From the report, right? The yeah. ten page report. Okay. Yes. Yeah, there was a lot of detail in there. So that is the turn that is how much it would take to get out of CalPERS. So they give you uh, they don't assume that they can earn six fifty. They'll assume a risk free yield, like a long term treasury bond of one and a half or two percent. And because they don't expect to get as much earnings, they're gonna charge you for that. And so that's why that's you don't that see other comes from members getting out of CalPERS, right. it's too, it's cost prohibitive. Yeah, I, I figured that. I just wondered where those numbers came from. And in order to change anything within CalPERS, like, I mean, the, the, the reason, as you mentioned earlier, that we, this is a defined benefit plan, and that's why the amount of money that, that the investments make trigger the problems for the rest of the world in trying to make those defined benefit payments to the retirees. What, what would it take to change uh, the plan to a defined contribution plan. That's not something cities can do, correct? That is not something cities can do. I mean, the one, CalPERS has, there's the, the PEPRA laws, right? Which, right? So new employees, it's lower cost plans, lower benefit. They're addressing this issue so it doesn't happen 20 years from now again. But right. the issue you're facing is, you know, based on what's happened in the past. Right. That's kind of what I was hoping the public would hear is that CalPERS all started in the year 2000, right around there, and it was in 2013 that PEPRA was enacted, and that that inaction was not by cities. That was by your state assembly, your state senate, and then it had to go through the governor too. So these are not these are not options for your city council to just change. This is what the CalPERS program is, and it it is what it has gotten us to where we are today and there has been some help from PEPRA 
but as we can see, the unfunded still uh, skyrockets exponentially. Okay, um, do we have any public comments? We have one public speaker, Ron Kirkish. Good evening, Mayor and Council. There was a report that was issued many, many years ago now called The Plan That Ate California. And that's what they're talking about, is how this plan uh, back in I believe it was around 1979, 1980, where uh, a group of senators uh, worked with CalPERS. CalPERS rewrote the, the whole plan uh, for, the, for them. And in that time, they said that uh, if any shortfall that they have, no matter what, whether it's, it's corruption at CalPERS or they make mistakes with their, with their investments, which they did during the housing crisis and stuff like that, that the cities would have to bear the, the brunt of the corruption, of the, of the fault of CalPERS for mis, uh, invent, uh, in, investing in their money. Uh, prior to 1979, cities weren't, okay? CalPERS alone was responsible for maintaining the debt. I guess I could equate it to, say, uh, the homeless problem. We're not going to get out of the homeless problem until we get Sacramento involved. Not at all. And that's the same thing is going to be with CalPERS. We've got to find out how to get back to before the uh, Sacramento changed it to where to make the cities responsible. Again, corruption. It's pretty rampant at CalPERS, they found out. Uh, they've had to put people in jail, the leaders of CalPERS at one point, to the total of millions of dollars. And yet the cities are responsible for that. I know it's, it, it's, it's, it's not a thing that we can do right now, but I think I want to put in your minds that eventually if we're going to fix this problem, it's going to have to be with Sacramento with our elected leaders to fix it for us because we can't. Well, we're just going to be responsible for all their mistakes. Okay, and that's unfair. Thank you. Thank you. No others? Okay, we, do, we did all receive, there was one email to all of us. I know that, and that's, that's placed here. I don't think I need to, I'm not supposed to read that, am I? Even though it's only one? Yeah, so make sure everybody uh, got that too. It, it, it pretty much just uh, accentuates the severity of the problem and that we need to, we need to address it is what this person is saying who, who is a Gilroy resident. Okay, back to council. We could just accept an email as, especially this one is saying that I think it draws a false narrative between public employee pensions and private ones. And the time period that he's talking about really was when Ronald Reagan attacked the airline unions and so that really impacted the way that they contribute and, and what they were able to draw on from. So I think this email is a false narrative. I don't think it, it can compare to what we're dealing with in our city or, or cities throughout California. Okay, it's a person's comment, so right. I don't think you can, yeah, right. challenge it. I, I took it to say that the problem is severe, that this person's opinion. I was just opinion, addressing, yeah, what you, right, what you're, you're saying that this is similar to what we're dealing with in Gilray, and it's not. Like I said, I, I believe it to be a false narrative. Right, and I said I believe it's impressing upon us this person's opinion of the severity of the problem. I don't think I, are we, are, we're having a discussion on a person's public comment? Yes. Well, we never be, discuss them. We never. I know. Bring I was going to say if we this get was, a bunch of them every. Someone every was meeting. here. It if would be someone easier. was here, you would just say thank you for your comment and and okay. we would move on. So okay. Let's, let's move on. Alrighty. Are you waiting to speak? Okay. Move on, like move on to the next subject. Move on from public comment. No, go ahead. I'll, I'll wait until you. Oh. Okay. I, have, I have a couple of questions. Okay. Okay. More for staff. Though. No, that that concluded public comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, Harjot, do you want to? No. Okay. okay. Public comment is closed, so now it's back to council. What's next? What's next is how do we want to proceed? I'll, I'll wait yep. until. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, the purpose uh, really is to get some direction and feedback from council on the next steps. Mm -hmm. uh, if if uh, council would like us to explore the refinancing of the pension obligations further, uh, we'll go ahead and, uh, you know, come back. We'll do some additional work, what potential structures might look like, uh, update, you know, based on current market uh, analysis and, and come back and present some findings of what that structure might look like. <clears throat> okay, so council member Hilton. Um, I have actually have I have some questions about Pepra and maybe you or or Leanne can can answer because I'm I'm a little confused. So with our current structure for let's let's say the fire department, which is up there, right? One of the public safeties, and they're two percent at fifty seven, right? And we have the Pepra. So what what are they able to max out at? Like years, years wise, how many years of service can they can they max out? I think you know what I'm asking. And then versus the police department, like they're at two seven, two point seven, right at fifty seven. What are they? What's the difference between someone who's two percent at at fifty seven as opposed to two point seven at fifty seven? Pepra. If you give me a minute, I'll pull up the chart. <laughs> I don't have it memorized, but it's, it's easily accessible. Are you looking at the uh, annual caps? Yeah, yeah, the, cap? the, yeah, so like, the chart that shows years of service and then percentage that they can max out at. Okay, you know, yeah, you know I don't have that, but I do have the salary cap. Uh, that's that's two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, which is the cap on the peppers. Okay, should I move on to Councilmember Romanos and then come back to? How about that? Then we you know, it's you. not so pressured. Okay, Councilmember Romanos. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So, again, this is this is a very sobering report and the numbers are just I mean you look at something like this and, and you're, you don't even know at least for me I didn't even know where to start on something like this and, and mayor I believe you were one of the people who really helped get us on the path of doing something a couple of years ago and there's small steps um, in terms of in terms of paying early and reinvesting some of the interest saved into the into the, the the fund there, but but nonetheless they are small steps. So it, it's kind of like that old line, you know, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. And I think kind of seeing this for me at least, I, I recognize we have to do something. I mean, and and to the to the public comments that were made earlier, I, I agree. Uh, Sacramento <laughs> definitely plays a large role in the woes that all of us are experiencing, and and we're kind of left with the check. Um, but you know, unfortunately, it's our reality, and we have to have to address that. So, uh, so I, I am very much in favor of having staff come back to us with a list of uh, suggested actions, and, and and if possible, to the extent you're able to do so, coming up with some of the the different scenarios, the stress testing that was uh, was talked about for us, to at least consider what it might look like given different uh, market performances. So that that would be my recommendation. Thank you. I would agree with that one. Um, are you ready, Leanne, or should I move on? Okay, go ahead. We'll go back to Councilmember Hilton's question. Okay, so when you pull up the CalPERS uh, 2 at 57 retirement formula, that, that's the PEPRA formula for our fire public safety folks. Um, at 40 years of service, they max out at 80%. I think that's what you're asking. 80%? And is yeah. after 40 years? After 40 years. Okay, 40 years of service as a firefighter. And then... Uh, 30 and th years is 60%. Say that again? 30 years is 60%. So if they do 30 years, they get 60%, but they can do 40 years and get 80%. And then what about the 2.7 group? 2.7 at 57, which is the PEPRA uh, retirement plan for our police safety group. They... Um, can max out at 108% at 40 years. 30 years would be 81%. Okay. And then we have the second tier. So we have three tiers for police and fire, two tiers for miscellaneous. Got it. Um, so I'll, I'll give my feedback to um, on the suggestions to, to staff. So I, I obviously I'm in favor of that, the, continue to do that prepay. Um, I understand that, and uh, I'm not interested in trying to exit CalPERS. Um, I don't want to be the the leader in that because we're the only city in this county around us that actually does two percent of fifty seven, and uh, um, that's a that's going to be very hard to recruit and retain people, especially when everybody else is hiring 
at least public safety is hiring 2.7 at 57. Um, that's, uh, that's limiting us right now. Um, so I don't want to be the, the leader that gets stuck in something that's different than everybody else. Um, I'd, I'd rather follow. Um, I'm not really interested in a fresh start or um, restructuring with the, I'm sorry, with the pension obligation bonds. I'm not in for that, but I am still interested, obviously, in that Section 115 trust and then that automatic thing that we talked about, how um, uh, using our reserves to go back in there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Council Member Bracco. Yeah, I agree with uh, Peter um, at looking at everything that's on the table. I, 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 uh, I, I couldn't support refinancing, though, because that just seems like you're applying for a new credit card to pay off the other one. And then um, what I would have liked to heard on this report is, what kind of shape are all those cities in now? Have they accumulated more retirement debt on top of the money they borrowed? So if you could get us that information, that'd be nice, TC. Thank you. Okay. Or, or Jimmy, do you want to speak? Okay, because I've heard a very different, yeah. It, it actually, in, in previous years, I'll give you an example, the city Carmel, uh, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago, issued POBs, and then within the next year, they had another unidentified liability and that really angered people <laughs> very much because they thought they had paid off all their debt now they have two debt payments to make um, that would happen that second debt would happen whether you refinanced or not but it would just be part of that one debt payment you had to CalPERS and so that is you know the risk that you take knowing that there could be additional liability coming up in the future these most of these have been done so recently they had the benefit of the 21% returns they got last year and so they probably haven't been hit with new unfunded liability yet but the really the way I would I would characterize this is that if you look at the savings you could get um, which we're talking about two and a half to three million a year those are near-term savings that are pretty assured it's the long term that we say there's the risk so maybe for the next five years you're getting the two and a half three million in, in benefit you can use that for services it's year 15 year 10 that we just don't know that's the risk you're going to take, and that's why we feel obligated to identify that to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Armendariz. Thank you, Mayor. I, um, I think what you all did a couple years ago in terms of uh, Section 115, I think that sounds like a good option to continue. Um, I know we've had a difficult time filling vacancies. Our, we have a lot of um, openings with police, with 911 operators and other uh, safety <laughs> positions in, in both units or any of the three units. Um, and I think it's um, even harder because our benefits aren't that competitive. So um, I'd like to see us continue with what you all initiated already and, um, and take, the, take the risk in the long term. Okay. No other council member. Oh, do you have a comment, yeah, Councilman so, Tovar? Okay. Thank, thank you, Mayor. So, again, going back to my colleague, um, Council Member um, the Romo Neils, I agree. I think um, I would agree that we would allow staff to come back with an action plan in different scenarios because I think the comments that are being made are, are very valid and sort of concerns. And I think having a bigger picture of those scenarios, I think, would help us make the right decision. Again, I think we all have very similar thoughts, but I think having that in front of us and being able to really examine it would, would do at least me justice, and I think it would give us a better sense of where we, where we should go. So that's what I would suggest. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Hilton, you want to speak again? Yeah, I just have another question about PEPRA. Um, so did, does PEPRA, does that law prevent, like we're locked in at 2% at 57 for the fire right now. Are you, allow, are you allowed to negotiate anything higher than that? Or did PEPRA, like PEPRA locked what you were at, right? So every city in California, after they negotiated right before PEPRA, is locked into those positions. Is that correct? You can only go down. You can't go up. That is my understanding. Harjo, yeah. do you have a yeah, different I mean, understanding? There's, uh, That's what uh, I understood, uh, too. But. There's other exceptions as to, uh, you know, if you work for a, a previous organization for X number of, uh, you know, uh, 
number of years and then there's only been a, a small gap in lapse of service, uh, there's certain exceptions that allow you to go back to that uh, classic membership. But yes, uh, overall the intent is from that point on anybody else that's entering the system, you're locked in at that new rate. We can't negotiate yeah, we a new retirement formula with um, our bargaining groups um, different from what we have in place now under PEPRA. Right. Okay, so the police will always be at 2.7 at 55 and will and the fire will always be at 2. Point, at 2% at 55. 2.7 at 57. Will be police. And 2 at 57. Will always be fire. Yes. Thank you. Okay, for, so. For PEPRA qualifying, yes. So of the council members who have spoken and council member Marks is the only one I, I haven't heard from, um, what I'm hearing is that everybody wants to continue with um, investing any interest savings from paying annually yep. into the trust, that everybody wants to stick to uh, up to 25% of any unassigned, of which this council has not experienced yet because of COVID, but that as we go forward, up to 25% of any unassigned funds in the general fund will go into the trust. But I heard only three and those three being myself, Peter, and Fred supporting uh, looking at refinancing. So did I misunderstand that? Is there a fourth who supports that or not? So I guess we're not refinancing. Is there something you want to explain? Because I don't think that's being well understood. Well, I, th I think we are looking for some council indication of the interest. But if there is not interest, then we wouldn't go down that road because right. this is going to be expensive to explore. Right. Uh, this won't be free. And um, if there's a lukewarm reception at this point, um, I would wonder what it would be like by the time we got to the end of this process uh, once, uh, you know, you really get into it. Right. Didn't we see in our report, I mean, no, that was a different report. Never mind. I just want to make sure that, yeah, you're under – that. Well, it's not for me to explain. It's for you guys. So, and I do believe the concept of you know short-term gain versus long-term risk is is something that is dependent on each community. And and uh, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. This is a very fiscally conservative community, and they mean it. And that has served us well. <laughs> it really has. So I I certainly understand why there's a apprehension about re, you know refinancing debt. But um, we're showing you the benefits. We we do think it's something that a lot of cities have considered. We. We'd like you to, but we also understand that if the will of the council is not to do so, we won't continue to follow that strategic item that was on our work plan. So we're really looking for uh, some direction tonight to make sure that we're we're working on what we need to be working on. Right. So, All right, the, Mayor, oh. I'll be your fourth. You want? Okay. All right. But it is uh, Jimmy's. Cra it's it's an expensive endeavor. So you know uh, w that you only want to say that if you think there's a good chance that you're going to support that effort in the end. As long as it helps us save money. Yeah. You know, so that's what it's that right. Good. Our current our payment. The, the the critical thing to pay attention to, I think, in our reports is that our annual our, our minimum payment is going to be as high as twelve million dollars in 2023. That 2023 guys, we're almost into 2022. So 12 million a year, we, that is almost double what we've been used to, what, about six or seven is what it's been. That's how mm -hmm. fast it's going up. Yeah. This refinancing would bring down two to three million mm -hmm. for maybe five years. After that, there's no way to know, but couldn't you refinance again like people do in their mortgages, right? When The bonds would be callable, but then again, you're taking the risk of is the interest rate market going to be favorable at the time you really want to refinance. Right. So. Yeah, no, I understand that you don't know, but it just doesn't seem very prudent to just sit here and do nothing with interest rates as they are. But that I am one of seven here. So, so does, it sounds like uh, it, everybody's agreeable on the, uh, you know, savings from the prepayment uh, as well as the Section 115. Uh, we'll come back again with as part of the prelims kind of analysis of what that looks like, what those numbers look like. Um, and then as far as the exploration for the refinancing, uh, can I just get a confirmation? We have four We've got support. Four. Okay. Four. Fred, you got to lift your thumb. Okay. So you got four on that. And yes, and yes, we, the interest savings, everybody, and the up to 25% of unassigned at the end of the year. So maybe there will be something at the end of this year. We don't, obviously we don't know, right? End of this, end of this end year of doesn't mean calendar year. It means fiscal year. Fiscal year. Yes. Right. So end yes. of, it's so June of 2022. Okay, is that clear to everybody where we're going? Jimmy, okay, thank you. Thank you.
Oh, so next, sorry, I guess I should say we're on to the next item and Karen will give that report. <laughs> Yes, good evening, Mayor and members of the council. I'm actually just gonna kick this off and turn it over to Cindy McCormick to okay. do the bulk of the presentation. But I just wanted to start, it, start off with a discussion, give a little background and kind of a big picture overview of affordable housing policy. So we're excited to begin this discussion, first of all, and I get some initial feedback and direction from council. So this is clearly a priority issue for our community. We've heard it from council, we've heard it from uh, other boards and commissions. We've heard it from our community, our nonprofits, and service providers. And you know, everybody's expressed interest in really trying to do more to bring much needed affordable housing to Gilroy. So previously, the city largely encouraged the construction of affordable housing through the city's residential development or ordinance or RDO. And that policy, it was originally implemented in the 1980s and changed over time but it limited the total number of housing units that could be built over, it looked at 10 year increments, 10 year periods of how many units could be built and included an exemption for affordable housing projects. So really it was encouraging and incentivizing affordable housing by allowing it to bypass this, uh, this uh, RDO. But then on January 1st, 2020, SB 330 went into effect and that invalidated portions of the city's RDO. Uh, SB 330 included several elements, and in fact, uh, one of the things was objective design standards, which the council just approved last week. However, it also invalidated the city's ordinances or policies that manage, you know, any city's ordinance or policy that manage the pace or number of housing permits issued each year. Even if the measures were enacted by voter, you know, voter approved measures, this law still invalidated that. Um, the city still does have neighborhood district uh, with our new general plan, which really applies to any of the new, larger, undeveloped areas, and that does include a 15% affordable housing policy. So uh, the area to the very northern end and the very southern end of the city that's yet to be developed, that still will have an affordable housing uh, requirement of 15%. So as we embark on the process for considering local policy for affordable housing, there are a few things to keep in mind. Um, as you know, over the past few years in particular, the state has enacted legislation aimed not only to encourage housing, but to reduce what it perceives as the barriers to the construction of affordable housing. So our local policy should complement state requirements. The state also determines each city's obligation for affordable housing, both in terms of the number of units and level of affordability through the Regional Housing Needs Allocation, or RENA, numbers. And the new RENA allocation will go into effect in January 2023. Our local policy should support our ability to fulfill Gilroy's RENA requirements. The city is only one piece of the affordable housing puzzle. We do not construct or finance affordable housing, though it may be possible on a very limited scale. Our local policies should encourage and support key partnerships in developing and financing affordable housing. And probably the most important factor is Gilroy itself, the needs of our residents, the vision for our community and what works in Gilroy. We are unique from other Bay Area cities and it's important that we look at our demographics, data, do our research and listen to feedback from our residents and stakeholders. We will certainly look at best practices and innovative policies and programs in other jurisdictions. However, to be effective, our local policy should be based on Gilroy's needs and what works for our community. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cindy. One of the first things that we would like the council to provide feedback on um, are the outcomes that the council wants to achieve. And we've just listed a few examples here. For example, meet the RENA goals, um, provide incentives to developers and nonprofits, um, provide a variety of housing throughout the city. We're also asking the council to provide some direction on what you want us to study further. 
do you want us to look exclusively at an inclusionary policy or just incentives or a little bit of both? For the inclusionary policy, I'm just kind of kind of run through this slide and we're not seeking direction this evening. We're really just sort of getting a temperature check and to see what's completely off the table or what you absolutely want us to pursue. So for example, uh, where would an inclusionary policy be applicable? Would it be citywide? Only for PUDs? Um, are there, is there a threshold for development? Do you want it to only be units, you know, with 10 units or can we go down to five? Um, what's the minimum percentage? Is it 15%? Is it a higher number? Is it a lower number? Um, in any case, we are recommending that an economic feasibility study be done. Um, in terms of affordability levels, this is going to look different for a rental project versus an ownership project. So for example, you're probably going to get more very low income units in a rental property, whereas you might get more moderate units in an ownership property. Do you want to allow an in-lieu fee and when? Um, we recommend that an in-lieu fee study be done to see what the right number is. Um, you don't want to have it too high and you don't want it to be too low. Uh, and then one thing you want to think about is having these inclusionary units dispersed throughout the development rather than focused in one small area of the area development or you know 100% affordable rental project. And then also looking at anti-displacement standards. You know once you start to gentrify an area you're going to lose some of your low-income residents and there's ways, ways to avoid that. In terms of an incentive policy, we just provided some examples, um, bonus concessions beyond state law. Um, again, asking what is and isn't off the table. Accessory dwelling units, we have an opportunity to take advantage of the um, state's determination that we can apply these units to lower um, RENA units. Micro units, this is something that we have, um, currently have in our housing element as something that we might want to look at. Missing middle housing, this is your duplex, triplex, fourplex. Um, the SB9 uh, state law um, is looking at duplexes, for example. So again, just to wrap up, we are asking um, what are your desired outcomes? And what type of policy um, do you want us to look into further? And this concludes my report. All right, thank you. All right, um, Council, I'll start with everybody up here. So, Council Member Bracco, you can go first. Cindy, um, what, what could the city do to um, incentivize developers to build more triplexes and fourplexes? So for example, right now our current code requires um, developments of two or more units to go through an architectural and site review process. We could say, for example, just duplexes that could be approved ministerially as long as they comply with objective design standards. So that's one incentive. Make it easier uh, to have those type of projects approved. And um, right now at the current time, What's the percentage of affordable do we require in a housing development? So our, our only in, um, in policy is the neighborhood district policy. It's a 15% requirement and it's only those properties that are already designated as neighborhood district. And, and so the, generally it's the, those vacant parcels that are outside of our city limits. And when, when we, when, when they use that, um, by just saying affordable, it really doesn't mean anything. Does it have to go like low income, medium, uh, like that? Yeah, so uh, many cities that have inclusionary policies will say, um, so if you, let's just keep it simple, let's just say 10%. So 2% um, of the 10% has to be at the moderate level and then you you know, apply the percentages across the different arena categories and a feasibility study would tell us like what, what's the right mix. Okay, but one thing I've noticed though with, with our policy 
is the developers put that off until the end and then try to sell off the project to somebody else. And sometimes it never gets built. Mm -hmm. So what, what do we need to do to, to make some changes to get, the, get those done? I guess I don't really understand the question. Well, um, we need to incentivize the developer to build the affordable housing during his construction of his whole project, not at the end, because what happens, a lot of them at the end, they never build it. So. Uh, some inclusionary, and uh, hopefully this answers your questions, but some inclusionary ordinances are structured to say, or did the uh, deed restriction agreements are structured to say, you must build the affordable units first before you can occupy the market rate units. Okay, we can do that? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. That was my question. And and I'll just add that, um, for Dion, that um, we can... Um, get more affordable housing if the developers utilize the density bonus law. So they get more density if they provide the affordable units. But we haven't really had a lot of projects that come have come through with the density bonus law, but that's another mechanism. Okay. Thank you. All right, Council Member Armendaris. Thank you, Mayor. I'd, um, I'd love to see us explore um, language for an inclusionary, uh, inclusionary housing ordinance that um, starts with two units, right? Anybody building two units plus um, at at least a 15% uh, BMR building rate. Um, I think there's advantages to both having an in lieu fee and a mandatory construction. But um, if we could also look at a combination of both, a hybrid, um, I think that could, I mean, there's benefits in different ways, right? Because if we get the money, then we can negotiate and partner with the county or partner with, um, a, you know, an agency that will help us build or grants, whatever. I think it gives us flexibility. Um, I'd like to make sure that the BMR units that are built are at least the same size as the smallest, um, and I hate to even say that, right, the smallest market rate unit, but but we don't want folks to be um, put in a, in a really uncomfortably small unit just because it's affordable. So, and I'd love to see it um, fleshed out to maximize the amount of um, extremely low and low income versus um, just affordable, right? Because they get a, we, we can't get away with that any longer. We need, we need things that are truly affordable for, for the residents and the, you know, the income levels that we have here. Thank you, Cindy. Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, no, I would agree with Councilwoman Armendariz and Mary Dan when we talked about um, below market. I mean, truly it's, you know, truly affordable is what, I mean, I would be in favor of. Um, and one of the things that we're talking about, I mean, sort of goes hand in hand with what both my colleagues said. You know, when we talked about, you talked about incentivizing it for developers. And one of the things, mentioned is sort of the process time, you know, where I think again that needs to change because I think that's a discussion not only in this topic but for many different topics regarding process time, but again, you know, making it more marketable, making it easier for developers, encouraging them. But again, also depending on what the rest of my colleagues say, be aggressive in saying this is what the council is looking for, this is what the city wants. Um, but I think it starts from that period of time where Again, it's a process time where, you know, we're going to make it easy for them. But I, I again, I'm going to agree with a lot of the comments that were that were made just just earlier. You know, we need to be more specific in regards to what we're looking for. And again, I think as prices go up and up and up, um, affordable is is a different. You know, there's a different definition for that for everybody. And I think we need to really look at what's truly affordable for our residents because again, as many of us have talked about. In, Express, I'm worried about sort of the younger generation leaving Gilroy because they can't afford it, you know. So I think that's where sort of I stand. I, I, would, I would go hand in hand with what's been said earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Marks. Cindy, can we 
stipulate a certain dollar amount that would fit with our mean income here in Gilroy or medium income. So for I guess what I'm saying is for the below market rate, our families to qualify here in Gilroy would have a way lower salary than maybe a, a below market rate in another city. And can we look at a developer and say, I'm just going to throw this out, you know, a $200,000 home or a $300,000 home, is that acceptable in writing an inclusionary policy? Because, you know, if people are working, both of them, they deserve to have a house and they're never going to get ahead. And I guess I go back to thinking about, I know all the council members were talked to a few weeks ago by a, a potential project in town. And he talked about, look, we're going to help you with your arena numbers. It's going to be affordable. You know, look at all the affordable homes we're being put in. And I asked him, I said, well, wh where do the affordable homes start? He goes, 700000 I said, for Gilroy, that is not affordable. And so anyway, can something like, you know, can we stipulate a dollar amount for below market rate? Julie, did you want to say? Well, do you want to? Well, well, it's uh, based on county uh, AMI, right. area medium income. And so it would either come from HCD and then it goes to the county. And we've had this problem all the time in Gilroy yeah. is the income levels here may be lower than income levels in San Jose, but the AMI is based countywide. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's been a problem. And I know way way back in 2008 or nine, we had some projects where the uh, homes that were market rate were selling at or lower than the below market rate homes. And so then we uh, allowed the, the, B, the BMR units to be sold lower or something like that. I think we tried to adjust that, but um, that was just how the market and the, the, when they were priced at AMI, that the AMI didn't go down when the recession hit. So yeah, and that's especially too at the moderate income level because um, you know if you if the moderate income level is the market rate level in Gilroy, developers are not going to want to restrict um, that for you know 45 years. Um, so does that answer your question? So the answer is no, you can't, yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, thank you. I know it's not encouraging, but, you know, the thing is we're not helping our own, and I'm not blaming you at all for this. I'm just making a comment. We're not helping any of our, our families here that really need that type of housing. We're going to be providing housing for families coming from out of the area, and we're still going to be in the same fix. But So you can have a, a local preference in your inclusionary ordinance, and, and Julie might have some... Um, feedback on this as well, but you can say that we're going to prioritize um, these BMR units for people who live here, who people for who pe people who work here. And it could include for renters and homeowners, I mean, rental units and um, and purchases, right? Yes, you can have those preference lists for for sale and for the rental so that you have your preference list and you always have to sell or rent to a qualified purchaser or qualified renter based on their income. But those preference lists, we have to be very careful not right. to run afoul of housing laws. So those have to be looked at carefully. The Mayor, and I don't want to take away from someone's question, oh. but I, can I add to that? Okay, sort of, you're after yeah. Council Member Hilton. Is that okay with you, Council Member Hilton? No, go, totally. Okay, okay. 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 go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and it's something that was just brought up regarding the local preferences. You know, and I, I think, again, if it's something that we have not sort of made it, you know, a concrete sort of policy or whatever. It's something that we should have been done a long time ago because we continue to hear that we have other residents from other cities, you know, renting homes here or apartments or getting these condos or these up low income apartments. But if we have or we're able to do a local preference, why aren't we doing that? You know, so again, so there's never that belief that we have other folks from other cities coming and taking these homes away from from our local residents so i don't know julie you just mentioned you know we've got to be careful but what does that mean can we instill something now and we'll you know we'll figure it out later or apologize later i think it's something that we need to do yesterday because again we're seeing more and more folks coming from out of town and more of our residents leaving town so, thank you 
Okay, Council Member Hilton. Um, sorry? Yeah, I'm still, I, oh. I raised my hand again. Yeah, oh. but that, you can go. No. I'll just go first. Um, is, I just have a question. Are corporate linkage fees traditionally included in inclusionary housing ordinance if they're for housing or are they con usually constructed separately? Can you repeat the question? Are oh, corporate I can, I linkage fees, this. are they separate or they can they be included in inclusionary housing ordinances? They are usually separate. And um, I know that there were some cities in Santa Clara County a few years ago that did a linkage fee study. And I'm not sure. Um, it was like Santa Clara and Sunnyvale. Santa Clara, Sunnyvale. I know San Jose has one. Um, I'm not sure where the other cities went with it, but I do know that they got a, a study and that's for office and uh, commercial buildings that right. will provide, and that's separate than the inclusionary because office and, and retail and commercial um, aren't subject to your inclusionary, but you can be subject to a linkage fee, and that needs its own special nexus study. Okay. And Santa Clara has one, yeah. and I've looked at it, and. Um, some of the other cities and and they are uh, big fees and they usually um, phase it in over a year or so but um, uh, yeah but that's separate than inclusionary so that okay. is um, because inclusionary is for housing and so the linkage fee is for the commercial non non-residential uses and they then they'll pay their share for their that's housing part. impacts yeah so the housing impact is part of the Part of that, yep. Okay, thank you. Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor Blankley. Um, you, you had a lot of questions in those, <laughs> in those, the, the, those slides. It, it, it might have, for a person like myself, I, I have a lot to say. I, I think it would have been helpful to have those questions before, and I might have been able to, to submit something, but I don't know if you want to go back a couple of slides to go through some of those questions that you wanted feedback on. These so, are just, uh, you know, we're not looking for direction this evening. We're, uh, I really want to see, like, what's completely off the table? What do you want us to explore further? Okay. So I think that it should be applicable citywide, the inclusionary policy. Um, I'm for the development threshold. I'm for two-plus units and more. Um, percentage set aside, um, I do think that 15% is a good starting point. Um, and in the feasibility study, if they could also look at differentiating between downtown um, inclusionary and outside of downtown. Um, some cities do like a 10% in downtown and 15% outside of downtown. So um, that shouldn't be too out, out, out of the field for them to look at. Um, I, and I am interested in the, in Luffy. Um, and I think that, that one of the ways that a good in Luffy would work is is if we are going to partner with um, other organizations to build that that possibly could be used as our portion, like whether we own the land or we don't own the land, but that could be our portion into um, providing that that boost or that those monies for let's just say like ELI. Um, I do like that part. Um, can you go to the next one? The um, when it comes to the accessory dwelling units, so the I'd be interested to see that side letter that that the collaborative would come up with. Um, I think that 30%, allocating 30% of our arena figures to uh, accessory dwelling units is is uh, is going to be tough. I mean, if we go to what we produced in 2020, we produced 13, all right? That was in our APR. Let me let me just kind of um, clarify what this is saying. So. If you if you have 10 80 units a year, three of those units we can apply to the above mod category, three at the mod, three at the low, and one at the very low. Right now, the way we, uh, when we bring our annual progress report to you, the way we've been doing it is we put them all in the moderate bucket. So HCD um, is saying that they they think it's feasible for us to say, well, some of these units are in the very low income category instead of putting them all in the moderate bucket. So it helps us with our arena because we're not just looking at moderate um, units. Okay, so I completely read that wrong then, right? You're not considering allocating, saying like, let's go down the ADU route and allocate 
or plan for 30% of our, of, to meet our needs of any of those levels, we're going to get them out of eight, doing ADUs. That's not what we're saying. No, no. So All right, thank you. We build, we, we build 100 ADUs, um, 30 of them we could apply to the uh, very low or the low, the low income category. Okay. And, and you said last time that, that you use those, um, we use those for, for moderate. Is it because we're assuming that they're moderate or are they actually deed restricted as moderate? No, so that's, that's the trick is they're not deed restricted. And okay. so the safest route um, that cities have been taking and the directions we have been given in the past is that it's safe to assume that they're at the moderate level. Mm -hmm. But now HCD is going, hey, you know what? Actually, some of these units are being rented at these lower income rates. Okay. Um, and so go, going down that path, like you had talked about in the staff report about actually like trying to really promote the ADUs and getting the local architects to put plans, that, that's huge. I think that that would work. Um, and because I think that use, utilizing SB9 and utilizing the ADUs um, as that sort of just organic, like, like sort of what you're describing, that organic um, building and housing, I think is great. I think that um, you know, utilizing the, the CALFA grants that are out there right now to, to people that are qualified by income to build those ADUs is, an, is important to share that with them as well. Like the Santa Clara County um, Office of, uh, of Realtors has a website that they have, um, you know, like the grant funding here and here's what San Jose is doing. It'd be great to partner with them to, you know, so this can grow outside of just being on a city's website, but to really be out there to promote the ADU, because I do think that that's, a, that that's a good way to do it. And that's something that we can actually do right away. We can update our website to provide links to some of these, you know, programs. Yeah. Okay. Councilmember, I was trying to get everybody to give their qu ask their questions, and then I would like, we need to go through each item. Yeah, that's what I thought we were doing. Got, we're not doing that? I, we haven't we haven't been doing that yeah so yeah so it's okay I just have a, a different way of going about it if you could just ask your questions and then we'll do thumbs up or thumbs down to whether or not we even want to consider some of these things oh I had no idea we were doing it that way uh, right because I was waiting for everybody to ask their questions that was going to come back to me and I didn't want to interrupt you but I decided I would interrupt you <laughs> so, no, I, I didn't really well, okay. she said she's not taking direction tonight right. so I wasn't sure it, well, why is it a thumbs up get, thumbs she, down she's not she doesn't mean specific direction what she's saying is she needs to know if we're even interested in an inclusionary policy, for example, because we don't have one. We just do in lieu of fees. So that we have to get to those levels first for, for Cindy to know where to go from here. So if it's okay, let me just go to Peter and then I'll give my comments and then we can go down just the way Cindy has it organized in the report as to which things and then we can get into the details of how many details she feels she needs at this time for each one of those things. Would that be all right? Okay. So and Madam Peter, Mayor, if that's the way we're going to be proceeding, then I can just wait to jump in. Okay. Yeah, if you don't have any questions no, on what no, some no of this questions. stuff means right now, no. then we'll go to that. Okay. Um, and Councilmember Marks, did you have something to, no, to add? No. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So I wanted to, mine is that uh, I do think we should have inclusionary and um, in lieu combination, but that's what I want to get council census, consensus on. So, in, in staff's report, in Cindy's report, um, the, with the first slide she put up, it was on page, I need to put my glasses on, sorry, on page 28. So she's asking right off the bat, what, what do we want to say are our affordable housing policy, um, what, what outcomes do we want to make sure that she hits, right? And so I will start and say that I would like to make sure that she hits the, the last two. Meeting the RENA goals to me is, is is not as important as the, as the last two. And I don't mean that meeting RENA goals isn't important. What I mean is we need to address it in the way of items two and three first, and then go back. That's my opinion. What does the rest of this council want to, want to say about that? Is, what are the desired outcomes? All three of those, the bottom two of those, what would be, Dion, we'll just start with you. What, what are the desired outcomes we want to give staff for this process? The bottom two, but also the first one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would put it three, two, one is how I would rate them for me. Oh, in order of importance. Okay, that's a good way to do it, actually. Okay, Rebecca. Um, inclusionary would be my my priority. No, um, the desired outcomes. The top oh, three. The top first. Okay.
you, it's okay the to just, arena goals. The arena goals are number one for you. Number one. Okay. And not the other two. Um, they're just less, less of a priority, but yeah. Or okay. Yeah, I'm good with. Okay, one. Carol. Yeah. I'll do three, two, one. Okay, and I'll do three, two, one. Zach. I'm trying to see what direction to give uh, on these things. So we're saying we could just say all three. Then. Yeah, we have to. We, we have to do all three. I mean, okay. <laughs> we're not going to be able to meet our arena goals if we don't. We don't have, no city meets the arena goals, Zach. I think you know that. Okay, we we attempt to meet them. We don't meet them. Okay, so this is an effort. An effort. So if we want to go ahead and give direction, if there's council consensus to give direction that all three of those are desired outcomes, then that's fine. Yes. I, I think it's important, though, that we prioritize among those three because the way I'm looking at it, I see the bottom one as being the most important because I think everything kind of flows from there. If you have a variety of housing types throughout the city, it helps to incentivize the affordable housing and meet your the arena goals. Okay. So, so for me personally, that's how I would pr prioritize it. Yeah, that makes sense because if you do number three, number two and one are going to follow. Right. So three. So so far, then we have Councilmember Bracco, Marks, and myself all saying that the first one, the one on the bottom, is the first priority. And okay, mm -hmm. and and the second one is the second, and the top one is the third. I can okay. support all three. Right. I can, but I just I, I can't understand how number three would, because we've been left to that already, where where developers have the option to build different types of housing throughout the city. They haven't, and we don't meet our numbers. No, but that's right. what staff is going to come. Yeah, right. so so I'm open to all three. We're asking but. them right to come back with something that will help us better meet mm -hmm. the idea of housing variety types throughout the city. Yeah. And that's Mayor, what that third yeah, one is. Mayor, and for me I, again, I, all three of them. Obviously, I'm in support of all okay. three of them. Um, and okay, I, so I, we can move yeah. on from this then, right? Cindy, are you fair, clear enough on where the council? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so then it comes to. The, the next thing she's got listed under incentives, policy, options. So you had only three up there, but there are actually five in the report. So you have bonus concessions beyond state law, incentivize accessory dwelling units, incentivize micro units, incentivize missing middle housing. Are those things you want us, Cindy, to give you our individual opinions on, those things, or do you want to do it differently? So are there, are there things on this list that you don't want us to study? Are there things that are more important to you? Do you want, you want okay. us to spend more time on? So for example, does anybody on the council have something completely against micro units? Is that an example of what I you would mean? Like, I would like that defined a little bit better, micro units. They're just tiny homes or what are they? Yeah, so if you, you can imagine um, like a, a mixed use development, right? So you've got the commercial on the bottom and you've got a number of units um, above. Mm -hmm. So you can have, you know, 20, um, 1,000 square foot a little apartments, or you can have, you know, much more smaller units. So maybe they're 500 square foot studios. Oh, okay. Right, um, and it's important that um, when you're talking about micro units, that you're putting these in the higher density um, designate, designated areas <coughs> because they are going to increase the density for our project. I see. All right. Thank Does you. it also include tiny homes, though? Uh, it could. So uh, you, if you have um, a, a, a vacant parcel in a high density area, you could, you know, but put a bunch of uh, tiny homes on the property. And that could include neighborhood districts that have high density areas. Sure. So you okay. get in the neighborhood district area, you could do a bunch of tiny homes. Sure. Okay. So is there any housing type that anyone on this council wishes to express now do, do not, you don't want staff to consider or to come back with information on? I, yeah, I don't have any that I would specifically want to exclude. So that's the question. And are there, are there, um, are there uh, some of these options, are there ones that stand out the most to you? You want us to spend the most time analyzing are there things that aren't on this list that you want us to look at? For me, it's, uh, I'd like to know more about the micro unit. I'd like to, um, to make sure that we are looking at citywide, like that these be distributed citywide, not concentrated in any particular area. Mm -hmm. Carol, do you want to add anything? 
No, no, it's okay. Okay. I, um, as far as priorities, um, I think people who were going to do ADUs, a lot of them have, have, have done. I don't know as successful there. I'm not trying to omit them, but I know what they are, and I, I don't know how much more we can do to incentivize ADUs. Um, micro units definitely have their potential. I look at them very similar to the issue we had in 2018 when we had um, live work units proposed at that one development, and the issue was how do you define live work? They weren't really defined, and they were turning out to me to just look like apartments, one and two bedroom apartments, and not necessarily live work. So we need very specific definitions with that so we can understand what they are. Um, I certainly like doing all things citywide, mixing different kind of housing types, but it's also critical to realize that so much of the city doesn't have access to transportation at all. And, you know, other parts have at least some, albeit not so great, once every hour, but at least they, they can get there. And other parts of the city cannot at all. Um, the missing middle, to me, is very important. Something that we have, the duplexes, we don't have, we have some, but we don't have very many. So to the extent that we can figure out how to get a developer to want to build those, to incentivize that, I think would be very helpful. Mayor, if I could again. Okay. Um, in terms of ADUs, I know uh, when I was on the Planning Commission, we explored or actually uh, approved expanding to the state maximum size for ADUs. But then um, on city council, I guess it, it was rejected. So I'm wondering, could we explore looking at that again of, about the size of the ADUs to what the, the state allows? Because I think it incentivizes it for, for, um, for homeowners or property owners to be able to charge a little bit more or have a whole family there instead of a, you know, a, a family squished into a smaller unit. So I think in our last um, ADU update, we complied with the new ADU law. So there's a minimum of eight, yes. So there's a minimum now of 800 and they can go up to 1,200 square feet. So, um, and um, then there's different review process, but um, you can no longer restrict the size. You can have certain sizes of them. And so um, the agency, local agencies that were trying to make them small, the state got rid of that. So um, we, you just now have height setbacks and parking requirements. Okay. And I think it's four foot setback, 16 feet in height. And then if you're 800 square feet, but no less than 800, and then I think if you're 750 square feet, you can have a ministerial approval. So they're really incentivizing and they took the cap off Okay. The size. Okay. So that was taken care of in 2020, I think. Yeah. Thanks, so. Julie. Okay. Councilmember Hilton? Um. Just just reacting off the ADU. So you're saying that our our ordinance that restricting the maximum to 1,000 is not in guidance with state law? We can go up to 1,200 now? I'd, I'd have to look at our ordinance, but I believe there, yeah, I, I believe we can go up to 1,200. So we restrict it right now to 1,000. Mm -hmm. We do. Mm -hmm. That's what Councilmember Armendaris was saying. We, we restrict it to 1,000. You can't go over 1,000. If we just went with state law, it'd be 1,200. 1,200. Yeah. I'll have to I'll have to look at that, but I and I don't know why we did that, but um, because our ordinance did go to HCD, so I know they approved it. So because um, it was it, it was a right that we had, we could limit it to a thousand if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. That was correct. But are you saying that might have? Yeah, changed? and then there's a and then there's a twelve hundred square foot. Max. requirement that's a max. also so it, yeah, it depends on whether it's detached or not yeah. the the size limits okay so the point is taken and we can find out oh okay <laughs> councilmember hilton on these any of these that you want to give cindy direction on how you would prioritize them the importance of them no councilmember tovar no and councilmember lormenos no okay so then cindy from here do we go to exclusionary uh, i mean inclusionary policies versus <laughs> sorry <laughs> versus uh, in lieu fees, right? You want direction here too, correct? Yes, yeah, so is there anything that's um, completely off the table? Um, do you have some direction that you wanna provide us for further analysis? <coughs> okay, so Councilmember Bracco? With, 
every with what with what she's got the way she's because those are just example numbers we've heard Councilmember Hilton and Councilmember Armendaris use two plus units as the threshold and not ten. So do one thing that, um, I have heard is that you if we do adopt an inclusionary policy that you want it to be citywide. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I agree with that, but we'll get yeah. Just because as long as we don't ha as long as we are not an employment center. And as long as we need transportation and we don't have it, and as long as parking is something that we're saying we're not going to allow for, then I don't see how you can have this in all parts of the city. You know, unless you go with, you understand that people will, they need to have access to their vehicle, which means they need to have a place to park it. See, I agree with that. I, I'm not for it citywide. So I think uh, housing mix, yes, but well, Mayor, if I if I may, I, I, I would I would disagree with that. I, I would I would be in favor of citywide. I, I understand your concern regarding transportation, um, but given the sort of severity of this, I, I mean, I think it has to be citywide. You know, um, if the concern is transportation, parking, again, then there's other options. Obviously, as walking, biking, whatever it may be. I would hate to sort of not sort of recommend this because of that thought of that um, there's not enough transportation, which I agree with you, don't get me wrong. Um, but uh, me, I would be in favor of citywide. Okay, so our, Dion, do you have anything else you want to add? I'm not for it citywide. You're not for it citywide. Okay, and Carol, you're not for it citywide. Rebecca is for it citywide. I am not for it citywide unless parking requirements can be, right. uh, can right. be part of it. But as long as, as we're saying parking is, is not something that's required, then no. And, and I'll, I'll join in with, with you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I've just seen it in too many parts of the city right now where it looks like a parking lot in a residential area. Right. And, that is so true. Yep. So true. I think that that's okay. largely because folks don't have anywhere to live, so they cramp up multiple families in, okay. in apartments. You're welcome to think or, that. Okay. So okay. It's true. Yeah. yeah, it was four to three on the citywide part. And I think we're, that's a slippery slope towards uh, something similar to redlining policies when we do that. Okay. Towards, discriminate, towards um, discriminatory zoning. So okay. I think we have to be careful with that. Okay. Um, and then one thing I will add is that the feasibility study will help us make a decision on what the right mix is for uh, Gilroy in terms of <coughs> what type of developments and what the percentage is going to be. Very good. So does anyone have any opinion on development thresholds to which it should apply? 10 plus, 2 plus, I've heard 2 plus from 2. 10 plus. Okay, Carol, because Rebecca's already said 2. Yeah, 10 plus. I would say 10 plus as well. 10, yep. And Zach, you were at 2, correct? Okay, so that's 5 to 2 at 10 plus. Okay. And then in lieu, in lieu fees, um, do we still want to have those, right? Are we suggesting um, inclusionary policy without in lieu of fees or a hybrid? Uh, Dion? I need more information on it, so I'll just say so. Both? Study Bring both? Bring back a study. Okay. Okay, bring back a study on the in lieu? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would agree with that too because you, I mean, that's one way to fund the housing trust fund that we had a report on at the last meeting and I don't even remember an amount from in lieu fees on that report but there must have been yeah just one thing yeah. to keep in mind with in lieu fees and, and the uh, the study will will give us more information is that um, you know some cities set that number too low and and you and you know you can put it in the housing trust fund but it's going to take a long time to build up the housing trust fund um, and some some cities make that number too high and then you, you know, discourage development. So the, right. the in lieu fee will look at what's the market in Gilroy and what makes the most sense. Okay. And by, are, does that include um, looking at both then, the in lieu and the construction requirement? So like there- To looking at, at using, getting a combination of both so that it we would, can- it would, uh, <laughs> Potentially the same um, consultant would do both reports, but the in lieu fee study will have a narrow, fo narrower focus. Okay. Yeah, because I'd still like us to look at doing a combination, a hybrid of both. Okay. So we can maximize our, our land and our, you know, our ability to partner with 
the county or other agencies. Okay, so am I hearing a, a consensus among the council to to consider both inclusionary policy and in lieu fees? Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. We have that. Anything else you need, Cindy? Specifically, was there something else you wanted to say, Zach? Since I interrupted you before that we didn't cover. Okay. Then Council Member Tovar. Mayor, no, sorry. I, I, are we done with this? I believe so. Okay. I just. I just want to go back to the discussion and I, in regards to what we talked about, the preference uh, policy, and I don't want that to go to the wayside, so I want to make sure that it's something that we all agree with or, you know, what further steps, because um, comments were made that we have to be careful, but I think that, you know, I think we have to be aggressive as well. But I don't know. I don't know if it's a discussion we have. What preference policy? I'm sorry. I'm not following you. Yeah. What preference policy? Well, we're talking about sort of um, working with developers and sort of asking for um, people who want to rent and sort of, um, you know, homes and stuff, we have a preference policy for local residents. Oh, sorry. So if everybody recalls that discussion. I do. I just wasn't <laughs> okay. tying it to what we were just yeah. discussing. But yes, I, I do. I remember that. Right. A preference for local residents to have first dibs right. on new housing in Gilroy. Right. right. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what everyone else's thoughts are on, on that. Oh, but yeah. Oh, do we have? I, I would support that. Anybody? Yeah, I, I can support that yeah. too. But we have to remember what Jolie said. They have to qualify, and <sighs> that's my concern: is that many of our folks can't qualify. So how do we meet our citizens' needs? Because that's why we're doing this to make sure our citizens can get housing. So. Right. <laughs> but that's that, the tricky yeah. part. But it's that time limit. They could be deed restricted. Like just like the uh, first time home buyers programs okay. that we have and the housing trust that we have, True. we do 35 year, 45 year terms. Mm -hmm. We can do that. Okay, stuff. Dion. Okay. Well, that that's a problem they ran into at Alexander Station for the I mean, it was the first three months. You had to be from Gilroy to apply, and people from Gilroy just didn't uh, qualify. Only 40 percent of our residents qualified. Yeah, it was real yeah. low. So we could still no. have a local. No. Okay, council member, we still have we could still have a local preference policy. It just means that we go to the local residents first. If they don't qualify, no. they don't qualify. Yeah. But it gives an opportunity for local residents to first. It it, the, it avoids the situation of a local resident didn't know. Okay. All right. Anything else? Mayor, you have public comment as well. Oh, public comments. My goodness. Thank you. Should have done that earlier. Sorry. Just one speaker, Ron Kirkish. Yes. Thanks again, Mayor, Council. Um, in regards to uh, what, what Councilman Bracco said uh, about, uh, about uh, making sure developers meet the requirements uh, I can still remember about, I think it was South Valley Housing, where uh, they had that stipulation, we gotta, we got to build this stuff. And they came back and said, well, we want to do it, and we're going to do it, but we have to have the sales of these uh, expensive homes before we can afford to build the below market homes. And then, if you remember, they came up and said, hey, we need your help. We're going we're gonna to die. We're going to go bankrupt. And so they, I think they had to bring in James Sooner at that time to try to bail him out. So I think Mr. Bracco is right that, hey, what can we do to make sure they do it? But the other thing is a lot of the discussion I've heard tonight is somebody asked a question, what can we do to incentivize our developers to build these units? And I haven't seen or heard too many things that would incentivize them. Maybe they need to be here to explain themselves. But so far I haven't seen anything or heard anything that that would answer that question. And then the other thing is uh, on the uh, linkage fee issue. Linkage fee or in lieu fees I believe were fees that uh, uh, San Jose did to say like if you're going to build so much square footage you're going to have to pay into a fund uh, one time I believe. And uh, that really is, uh, has a, a negative impact on people wanting to build. 
because uh, they're going to lose money and a lot of money. And so uh, maybe they're still building, but it could impact our, our city really bad. And then the other thing is the linkage fees. Linkage fees are, from what I have uh, determined, uh, and, and you, you can search out uh, Seattle and uh, see what linkage fees have done to them, if, if I'm correct. Linkage fees are headcount fees, as many employees and their annual fees. And uh, because of those linkage fees, they've driven uh, Boeing out of, out of Seattle. And they're about to drive Amazon out of Seattle. A Amazon hires 35,000 people that live in that area. And, Am and, and Jeff Bezos just the other day said, if, this, if you don't stop this nonsense, I'm going to move out. I might not move out of Washington, but I'm going to move out of Seattle. And that has a huge impact. So when people talk about these kind of fees, those are not going to be fees that are advantageous to our, our city because we've already seen what's happening to uh, cities like Seattle. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No other public comment. We can respond or have discussion, right? Because that was on the agenda. This is not public comment for items not on the agenda. I just want to clarify that in, in lieu fees, I want to make sure I understand what they are. They are what a developer would pay in lieu of building the affordable housing, right? That's, that's what that is, okay? And the incentives, um, that's what's coming back to us. We needed to first say what it is that we are prioritizing, what are the goals that we're giving staff to come back back with so that they can then tell us what their opinion is on how to incentivize for those kinds of housing that we just said. Okay? Okay. All right. So is there anything else that we need to do here tonight? Nope. Then we will adjourn to our meeting on Monday. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everybody.